Welcome to Her Story, the history of Southeast Asia told from her perspective. We'll discover historical figures, matriarchal societies, and contemporary female icons, and maybe learn about ourselves along the way. I'm Agas Ramirez. In this episode, we're going to meet Diagitarja, a Javanese queen regnant and the third Majapahit monarch reigning from 1328 to 1350. It is the nature of humankind to push itself toward the horizon. We test our limits. We face our fears. We rise to the challenge and become something greater than ourselves. A civilization. If you pay any attention to a little game called Civilization VI, there's a good chance that you've heard the name Gitarja. According to the game, as daring Gitarja, Majapahit queen of 10,000 islands, Indonesia's seas are your greatest strength. As exalted goddess of the three worlds, you shall spread your divine influence to all waters touched by the sun. Rely upon your loyal fleet, bold queen. Unleash a frightful storm upon those who bring strife to Indonesian shores. Sang Gitarja Ta'aku, Ratu Neng Kalawan Pangrak Saning Indonesia. Sintena Ikang Kumira, Aku Tanpa Bisa Lumrah Aning Dasaring Samudra. Gitarja is voiced by Dia Febriani. According to the game's creators, she speaks modern Javanese in honorific and polite Rama Inggil Register. Sira ang udohi pasir ikang luwe alit. Kawi gatin, pro pranaya ikan lan ingaranan ahayu. Historically though, she would have spoken Kawi Javanese, as Gajamada does in Civilization V, Brave New World. Gajamada is an important part of this story too. We'll get to him later. In her intro, she says, I am Gitarja, Indonesia's queen and protector. Those who thought us weak litter the ocean floor. Yes, yes, she said Indonesia when she probably should have said Nusantara, as Indonesia would not exist until the 18th century, but you have to admit, it's amazing to have this character in such a popular video game franchise. Joining her in Civ VI are Jayavarman VII of Kamai and Batriu of Vietnam. Ta là Triệu Trinh Nương, nữ tướng quân mặc chiếc áo hoàng bào. Ta nghênh đón người đã đến Việt Nam. Người chưa từng có âm mưu tiêu diệt ta, nên ta cũng sẽ không làm vậy với người. We learn more about Batriu in the next episode. But for now, we'll be focusing on the Majapahit Empire, also known as the last Indianized kingdom in Indonesia. Air quotes around Indianized. We really do need to talk about this. I wanted to last time, but I ran out of space. See, there's this guy. We've mentioned him several times, George Sedes. In 1968, he published a book called The Indianized States of Southeast Asia. Sedes said that Indianization meant the expansion of an organized culture that was framed upon Indian originations of royalty, Hinduism, and Buddhism, and the Sanskrit dialect. Obviously, many Southeast Asian nations were influenced by India through centuries of trade and other interactions, but to say that we were Indianized implies a passive absorption of Indian culture, when that clearly wasn't the case. Southeast Asia had its own civilizations and adapted elements from others, just as any civilization would. For some time, observers, mostly Western, thought Southeast Asia never developed its own culture, because all they could really see were the Indian elements of it, which they were more familiar with. I just want to highlight the fact that indigenous Southeast Asians were not passive recipients of Indian culture. There's a ton of critique of Indianization theory, so I need you to keep that in mind when you hear that word, especially because Sedis's book is an important resource. Okay, back to Majapahit. Oh, look who controls all the islands. It's the Mahajapit, Majahapit, Mapajahit, Mahapajit, Mapajahit, Majapahit. That's from a Bill Wirtz video called The History of the Entire World, I guess. Highly recommend checking that out on YouTube. So, Majapahit was based in eastern Java. 
It existed between the 13th and 16th centuries. We need to delve into how it was established because Tiagitarja's rise to power wouldn't make sense otherwise. The story pretty much begins in 1268 in a kingdom called Singhasari. The ruler of Singhasari was named Kartanegara, later known as Siva Buddha. His reign was marked by a considerable expansion of Javanese power in all directions. In 1275, taking advantage of the decline of Srivijaya, he sent a military expedition to the west. This established Javanese suzerainty over Malayu and probably also over Sunda, Madura, and part of the Malay Peninsula, including Pahang. After establishing his authority in Sumatra, Kartanegara turned towards Bali. He actually imprisoned the king of Bali in 1284, so he was feeling pretty good about himself. Lots of territories, conquering here and there. Around that time, the Mongols had been insisting that a member of the royal family be sent to the court of Peking. Kartanegara said, no thank you, which, obviously, knowing what you know, this is brave. In 1289, it appears that the envoy of Kublai Khan to Singhasari was mistreated by the Javanese. Put a pin in that, that becomes important. What happened next to Kartanegara is a series of miscalculations. He chose a common man who he elevated to the rank of Arya or governor. His name was Viraraja. But then he wasn't so sure of this Viraraja guy, so he sent him far from the court and named him governor in the east on the island of Madura. Madura is near another province called Kadiri, whose viceroy since 1271 was named Jayakatwang. Jayakatwang, according to Sedes, was very probably a descendant of the ancient kings of Kadiri and dreamed of supreme power. At this point, Kadiri was a suzerainty of Singhasari. Suzerainty means that you control your internal affairs, but another power, in this case Singhasari, controls your foreign policy. I know the names can get confusing, so to recap, Kartanegara was the king of Singhasari. Kartanegara assigned Viraraja as governor to Madura, near Kadiri. The viceroy of Kadiri was Jayakatwang, which was under Kartanegara. Viraraja, possibly because he was aware that Kartanegara didn't really like him, joined forces with Jayakatwang and told him when it was the best time to attack Kartanegara. The battle took place in 1292. Jayakatwang seized the royal residence, murdered Kartanegara, and founded the second kingdom of Kadiri. Now, of course, some of the members of the former Singhasari kingdom escaped. One of them was called Raden Vijaya. He was a direct descendant of the founder of Singhasari, and he was married to Kartanegara's eldest daughter, Paramesvari. He had a plan to take the kingdom back. He just had to wait for the time to do it. In his corner was Ardaraja. Jayakatwang's son, who was married to Kartanegara's second daughter, Mahadevi, making him Kartanegara's son-in-law. So the brothers-in-law tried attacking Jayakatwang, but they didn't have much success. They were pushed farther and farther out until they got to Madura, where he ran into who else but our good friend, the original traitor, Viraraja. Raden Vijaya didn't know who this guy was, so he paid him a visit, probably to strike an alliance. Viraraja knew how to pick the winning team, though, because he switched sides and helped Raden Vijaya establish himself in the lower Brantas Valley, the site of the future capital of the Majapahit Kingdom. The year was 1292. Now, elsewhere, several leagues away, Kublai Khan was still pissed about that thing that happened in 1289. Remember, his envoy was disrespected by the Javanese. He didn't know Kartanegara was dead, but he still wanted to avenge that insult. The Khan decided to send a punitive expedition to Java. I like that phrase, punitive expedition. It's a dramatic way of saying, go teach those people a lesson. The Mongols had three chiefs, Shipi, the Mongol, Nikomusu, an Uyghur sailor, and Kaoxing, who was Chinese. A Mongol, an Uyghur, and a Chinese walk into a bar. <laughs> Just kidding. They sailed past Champa, remember Champa from the last episode, and eventually docked in southwest Borneo. They sent a message to Singhasari, which didn't exist anymore, but Raden Vijaya got the message. 
Radan Vijaya immediately surrendered to the Khan's forces and asked them for help in taking back the kingdom, which they did. By April of 1293, the Khan's forces, along with what was left of Singhasari, defeated Jayakatwang. Now, Raden Vijaya wasn't about to let the Mughals stay and take power or anything, so he tricked them by asking for a small escort back to Majapahit. He then had the Mongol escorts massacred first before turning against the rest in Kadiri. You think maybe I should just rebrand as a true crime podcast for early Southeast Asia? There's a lot of material. <laughs> anyway, the Mongols left. They took with them several prisoners, including some of Jayakatwang's children, and Jayakatwang died without record. So to recap, the Mongol expedition that was out to punish Kartanegara ended up putting his legitimate heir on the throne. Take that, Game of Thrones. Okay, Raden Vijaya, now the founder of the Majapahit kingdom, consolidated his position by marrying the rest of the daughters of Kartanegara. With the eldest sister, Queen Paramesvari, he had a son named Jayanegara. But it was said that his favorite wife was the youngest sister, Gayatri Rajapatni. Rajapatni means king's companion. They had two daughters, Gitarja and Rajadevi. See, I told you all this backstory was necessary. Gayatri Rajapatni is a very important figure in Javanese history. We'll talk about Gayatri Rajapatni and her daughter, Yagitarja, after the break. You've heard of the terms colonization or decolonization in bits and pieces. But do you find European colonization too broad and too complicated to get into? Well, there is now a podcast for you. Join me, Fidelity, on an introduction through the history of colonization. We will cover not just the major wars and conquests that took place, but also the perspectives of people who have been neglected in the grand Eurocentric narrative of discovery in colonial lands. You can find the History of Colonization podcast on Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you get your podcast from. It is the great nature of Rajapatni Gayatri so that they become great leaders in the world who have no equal. Her daughter, son-in-law, and grandchildren became kings and queens. It is she who makes them rulers and watches over all their actions. Nagara Kretagama, Chapter 48 The Nagara Kretagama is an old Javanese eulogy to King Hayamuruk. The eulogy, written by Prapanka in 1365, contains detailed descriptions of the Majapahit Empire during its greatest extent. It also affirms the importance of Hindu Buddhism in the Majapahit Empire by describing temples and palaces and several ceremonial observances. In one stance, it describes the Queen Grandmother as Chatra Ningratu Isesa, the eminent protector of the world. Gayatri Rajapatni was the progenitor of the Majapahit Kingdom, because again, she was the daughter of the last Singhasari king and the wife of the Majapahit founder. The queen grandmother is said in the poem to embody Prajnaparamita, the goddess of wisdom in Mahayana. I feel like I say this way too much, but again, not a lot of sources here. During her reign as queen and together with Radhan Vijaya, Gayatri devised a strategy to build a government order on top of the remaining glory of the Singhasari kingdom. In a historical novel by Earl Drake, he notes that Gayatri managed rebellions and suggested to Vijaya to consider more complex structural problems instead of just the personalities involved in the rebellion. When Raden Vijaya died in 1309, he was succeeded by Jayanegara. He was the second Majapahit king. At the time, Jayanegara was just 15 years old. Later, according to Muliono at Mosiswarto Putras, Perempuan Perempuan Pengukar Sejarah. The king became paranoid that if his two half sisters, Gitarja and Raja Dewi, were to get married, he would have competition for the throne. So he essentially imprisoned the two while planning to marry them himself. This was not allowed in Javanese culture, and rumors about it started to spread to members of the royal family, including the queen mother. Now, the stories diverge quite a bit. Some say that it was a palace official named Gajamada who masterminded this. Some say it was just the healer, Tanka himself. But 
In 1328, when Jaya Negara was suffering from ulcers and needed surgery, Tanka took the opportunity to kill the king. When Gajamada saw the king was dead, he stabbed Tanka. With Tanka dead, there was no way to know why he did it or if the queen mother knew about it at all. Since Jayanagara had no sons, according to Sedes, the crown reverted to Gayatri Rajapatni. But she had entered religious orders as a bhiksuni, or a female monk, so her daughter, Gitarja, assumed the regency in her name. She became known as Tribuwana Wijayatunga Devi Jayawishnuwardani. In 1329 or 1330, she married a noble, Krita Vardana, and they had a son, Hayamuruk. She started her reign with suppressing the rebellions in the regions of Sadeng and Keta in central Java around 1331. It is said that she personally led the armies along with her cousin, Aditya Warman, in these battles. Aditya Warman would later become the king of Malayapura in Sumatra. In 1336, Gitarja appointed the palace official from the earlier part of the story, Gajamada, as Mahapati or Prime Minister. And at his inauguration, Gajamada took the Palapa Oath, promising his plan to expand Majapahit's territory and make it an empire. Gajamada would go on to become the most popular figure of the Regency period. During Gitarja's reign, Majapahit spanned not only the territory covered by modern Indonesia, but also that of Singapore, Malaysia, Brunei, and the southern Philippines. It was also during this time that the Ramayana and Mahabharata became a major part of Javanese culture. They were told through wayang puppet shows, Wayang tells stories by using the shadows thrown by puppets against a translucent screen lit from behind. These highly ritualized midnight to dawn performances may be viewed from either side of the screen, some of the audience sitting behind the dalang or the puppeteer, but most prefer to watch the figures as shadows cast on the screen. The Agitarja promoted Shaivism, Vaishnavism, and Buddhism as the religions of the empire. The region went through Sanskritization, or what was called Javanization, in the regions under the Majapahit influence. Because of this, many Javanese retain Sanskrit names, though they practice Islam today. The Majapahit Empire also has a strong architectural legacy, including the split gates called Chandi Bantar and the Pelingi, or the tower representing Mount Meru, that are today seen in Bali. You know which split gates I'm talking about. This is where those tour operators use the mirror trick to make it look like you're standing in front of a lake and the gates are reflected. Besides this, it was also during Diagitarja's reign that the Majapahit naval fleet developed a breech loading cannon called Chetbang. They used gunpowder technology obtained from the Yuan dynasty and were successful because they possessed the technology to cast and forge bronze on an early mass production basis. The Chetbang were mounted on small vessels and used in naval combat as anti-personnel weapons. I've read some descriptions of the effects of the Chetbang on the human body, and they are truly jarring. The elite forces of Majapahit protecting the queen regent and other royals was called Bayangkara. They used arquebuses or early guns as well. The Agitarja occupied the throne until 1350, the year her mother, Gayatri Rajapatni, died. With her regency over, she was succeeded by her son, Hayamuruk, who reigned under the official name Rajasanagara. According to Saran Shanmugam, a history enthusiast, the retired queen was appointed the ruler of Kadiri in central Java by her son and was part of Batara Sapta Prabhu, the Council of Royal Elders advising the king. At this time, Gajamada was still prime minister. Under Rajasanagara and Gajamada, the Majapahit Empire enjoyed an effective monopoly of trade in the region. Some scholars have argued that the territories of Majapahit covered present-day Indonesia and part of Malaysia, but others maintain that its territory was confined to eastern Java and Bali. Either way, Majapahit became a significant power in the region, maintaining regular relations with China, Champa, Cambodia, 
Hanam, and Siam. After Dyagitarja's death, she was deified as the Hindu goddess Parvati, as was the norm in those days. Her statue, which was located in Chandirimbi Temple in Trowulan, was moved to the National Museum of Indonesia in Jakarta. That's the image you see on the cover art of this episode. Here's a clip from Singapore's Asian Civilizations Museum discussing the statue when it was there on loan in their exhibition. This is my favorite piece of art in this exhibition because of just how magnificent and how beautiful it is. I'd like to point out two very interesting details. Um, the first is the fact that the statue is bedecked in glorious jewelry. And examples of this jewelry, which would have been made in gold at the time, uh, we have actually displayed in this exhibition. And the jewelry comes from ASEAN's own collection. Uh, the second interesting detail I'd like to point out are the two vases that sit at the feet um, of the queen. Uh, these vases are Yuan Dynasty style vases, uh, the Yuan Dynasty uh, having ruled China uh, during the period of the Majapahit Empire. Rajasanagara had no heir by his official queen, so he arranged to divide his kingdom between a nephew and his son by a lesser wife. In so doing, he broke the unity of the state and allowed local potentates to seize control of portions of Majapahit's territory. After his death in 1389, Majapahit rapidly declined and along with it, the last great manifestation of Hindu civilization in Java. The impact of the Majapahit Empire can still be seen today in so many things, including something very obvious. The flag of Indonesia retains the colors of the flag of the Majapahit Empire. In this episode, we trace the rise and fall of the Majapahit Empire. We talked about two of its prominent queens, Gayatri Rajapatni and Vyagitarja, with her full title, Tribuana Wijayatunga Dewi Jayawishnuwardani, the exalted goddess of three worlds which the glory of Vishnu radiates. We briefly considered rebranding as a true crime podcast for the Southeast Asian Age of Commerce. And we learned once again how the lives and decisions of a few people shape the course of history. Hope you like this episode. See you next time. Producing a podcast like this takes a lot of time and research. If you like what we do, consider joining our Patreon like Ashley, Shireen, Chanda, Yati, Kara, and Mondo who have been supporting this podcast. Thank you so much. Give us little as $1 to get a copy of the show notes with all the references, a shout out at the end of the next episode, and the occasional bonus episode. Patrons also now get a scannable Spotify magnet of the podcast in the mail. And if you can't join us on Patreon, just tell your friends about this podcast. That really helps. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at HerStoryCPod. That's HerStory, S-E-A, pod. Next time, we'll meet Ba Thieu, a 3rd century Vietnamese warrior who managed, for a time, to resist the Chinese state of Eastern Wu during its occupation of Vietnam. There are so many more stories to tell and we're just getting started. This podcast was written, hosted, and edited by Agus Ramirez. Thank you for listening and we hope to see you again next time. Sampai jumpa lagi! Hi, we're Tuk Tuk Box. We're passionate food lovers and culture junkies dedicated to telling the stories of our diaspora. We're an online retailer focused on showcasing Southeast Asian culture and experiences through food. We offer an array of Southeast Asian subscription boxes and products through our partnerships with vetted small business owners and local farmers. Everything we offer is exclusively a product of Southeast Asian entrepreneurs, creatives, and chefs made using carefully crafted ingredients and recipes from our own community. We are proud to share refugee, migrant, and intergenerational stories in every box we produce. In telling these stories, we aim to foster conversations around racism and colorism in our society, ultimately helping make social change. We are 100% Southeast Asian owned and female founded. Check out our various products now on our website, tuktukbox.com. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok under at tuktukbox. Hope you discover something new. Stay safe and stay snacking. <laughs>